wait, where are all those aggressive groups? Where are the, the really big aggressive groups? Well, you got to look at on the bottom. They were the only three that were read last week. Communication services, consumer discretionary, and then the worst technology uh, down 1.62%. If you click on this, it'll bring up all the different areas. Look at semiconductors. Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to this weekly market recap for the week ending August 30th. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host here uh, for hopefully the next 20, 30 minutes and uh, give you some of uh, uh, my take of what happened last week in the market. Um, it was actually you know, a pretty decent market. We we're just kind of flat in some areas, but strong in others. So there is some of that rotation going on that we've talked about in recent weeks, uh, but I'll show you hopefully pretty clearly where that rotation is leading us as we take a look uh, at the month ahead in September. First, let's go over and take a look at the major indices um, and what happened last week. So you've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I've got this on a percentage basis over here and in order. So the Dow Jones, which actually set a new all-time high at Friday's close, uh, performing really well last week, gaining a little bit less than 1%. Transports S&P 500, both uh, fractionally higher. IWM, which is small caps, the uh, mid cap index, and also the NASDAQ 100, all slightly lower, although the NASDAQ 100 was clearly the worst performing of our major indices last week. Uh, moving on to take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, you can see the Dow closing above 41,500 for the first time in its history, easily clearing the peak that we saw back in mid-July. So we've got one of our indices now clearly out into an all-time high uh, territory, which obviously eliminates the possibility, at least for the Dow, the possibility that we started a bear market back in mid-July. And that's what I had talked about recently. When you get that volatility index back down to a level, um, which I think is a little bit below the fear that's, that's required for a bear market, which I think the VIX needs to remain at least at about 16 and a half to 17, once it dips below there and then trades below it, it just tells me that we're not in a bear market. And as you can see, that was certainly the case or is the case with the Dow Jones as it set a new all-time high last week. The 10-year uh, Treasury yield finished the week out at 3.91%. So we did get back up above 3.90. We got back up above the 20-day moving average, which we hadn't seen in over a month. But you can see the last time we went up above that 20-day, we didn't stay there for very long, came back down. This time, I think there's a slight negative divergence. And you might look at this and say, well, there's no negative divergence because the yield doesn't ever go down below the prior. But remember, it's based on closing prices of the yield, not intraday or opens. So if you look at the closes, this was a close here on August 5th, which was just below 380. But we also had another close here later in the month that was a little bit just slightly below, um, maybe by about a half percentage point or whatever. Anyway, that uh, is a positive divergence, which tells me maybe we go up to the 50-day uh, moving average. That that's you know at least a possibility. Um, so I'm looking maybe for a peak somewhere between where we were at Friday's close, and then maybe back somewhere around four, four, and maybe 405, somewhere in that ter in that range is what I'd probably be looking for. But I still think the overall trend is down here. So to me, that would be the upside, like the potential to the upside. I don't think it's going to go any higher than that. At least I wouldn't expect it to. Um, and eventually I see it rolling back over and testing the recent lows. Um, of the key economic reports out last week, we did have durable goods come in early in the week. It was, it was very, very strong. But durable goods are also very volatile. So it's better to take maybe a three, six months rolling average, moving average of durable goods. Otherwise, you can get some really um, a false sense of what's going on because uh, durable goods for this past month was was strong, but then the prior month was very weak. And so you, got, you have to combine it. Also, uh, the durable goods this month, I think, was uh, uh, kind of flat if you took out transports. So it's really, uh, you know, you got to look a little deeper than just that headline number. Um, but I, I mean, I think for me anyway, it's more of a yawn for the, uh, tr the durable goods unless we see it for uh, quite a period of time. Consumer confidence, I think that came out on Tuesday and that was really strong, much better than expected. Uh, so I think that's just telling us that things are looking up, um, at least based on that one 
indicator. We had the uh, uh, GDP out. Uh, it was the second reading of Q2 GDP. The first reading came in at 2.8%. This was 3%, so it was a little bit higher. Um, I'm still kind of watching initial jobless claims, but really not much to look at there uh, because they came in almost as expected. Um, last week, there was a slight revision, but again, pretty close to what uh, we had seen last week, not really much of a re revision. So really nothing to talk about in terms of the uh, initial jobless claims. And then on uh, Friday, we had the um, core PCE price index. That's one of the indexes that the Fed looks at pretty closely. And it came in at uh, two, two tenths of 1% rise, which was exactly what the market was expecting. So no big surprises there. So we're just preparing now for September. I mean, I, I kind of feel like that's the way the market was. That's kind of how the market performed last uh, week. Saw a little bit more rotation into some of the more value-oriented or de uh, defensive areas. And if we look at the sector summary for last week, I think this will kind of show you what I'm talking about. Financials, industrials, materials, utilities, healthcare, energy, consumer staples, real estate. Wait, where are all those aggressive groups? Where are the, the really big aggressive groups? Well, you got to look at on the bottom. They were the only three that were red last week. Communication services, consumer discretionary, and then the worst, technology, uh, down 1.62%. If you click on this, it'll bring up all the different areas. Look at semiconductors. So NVIDIA reported last week, and the report was okay. I mean, they did beat. Um, they raised their revenue guidance. But with NVIDIA, after a stock like that runs up so much, you, you need perfection. I think their earnings per share came in maybe four cents ahead of expectations based on uh, Zach's, which is what I use. I think Zach's showed uh, NVIDIA coming in at 66 cents versus 62. I mean, it's a beat, but is it the kind of beat you want to see out of NVIDIA? I don't know. The market didn't seem to like it as much. We saw a gap down the next morning and uh, NVIDIA kind of traded off, um, you know, from that, from the earlier highs from last week. So... Anyway, semiconductors as a whole really didn't perform very well last week. And anytime you see semiconductors drop almost 5% in one week, probably isn't going to be a very good week for technology. That weakness there did mask some strength in some of the areas of technology. Computer services, electrical components, both gaining 2.5%, uh, you know, 2.3% 2 respectively. I mean, that's pretty solid week. So again, it's just... Uh, you know, when you dig into it, technology overall, not a great week, but there were some areas uh, that did hold up okay. I mentioned financials, industrials at the top, doing the best last week. Look at this financial chart. I mean, this is where you're looking at rotation. You're wondering, okay, where's a good place to invest? I mean, there's really not been a better place than financials. And I've talked about that, talked about it all the way back to the beginning of the year when I said we were going to start the lower rates. I thought small caps would do really well. I thought financial, especially banks, would do well. And that's what we're seeing because we're finally starting to see um, the reaction, the market reaction to the Fed finally um, acknowledging that their battle with inflation is over. <clears throat> and now they're ready to move on to the economy. They're ready to lower rates. They said last week from Jackson Hole, we could go Friday. Um, Fed Chief Powell said, that it is time for the Fed to adjust policy, which means they're, it's time for them to start lowering rates. So what you're seeing in financials and in industrials is really what I would have expected back at the beginning of the year when I called for lower rates, better financials, industrials, and so forth. Anything that's uh, more um, uh, cyclical should do better. Small caps, clearly the small cap banks, mid cap banks, they needed the relief. They need Fed funds rate to come down. That's their. That's one of. That's how they borrow. So their borrowing costs will come down, and that'll allow them to free up more and more access to capital by their smaller customers. And if you have more access to capital, you can grow your business. If you can grow your business, earnings start to go up. Guess what? Multiples expand. So that's what I've been looking for. I think we're starting to see that in uh, many of these areas, and I, I think obviously the financials you can see very very strong here over the last month or so. Remember when we got the, the June CPI out on July 12th? Look at what the financials did immediately. Immediately broke out above this double top. Then we got closer to, I think we were still near that high right when we had the, the Fed meeting. And then the Fed said nothing 
about lowering rates. They just said, you know, lowering rates, you know, a rate cut was on the table for September, but they didn't make it clear. Then the minutes came out a couple of weeks later and said, oh, rate cuts are likely. Well, whatever. That's not exactly what Powell said. And I thought he was in the meeting. But anyway, uh, continue to roll up. And now again with uh, the Jackson Hole speech talking about change in policy, financials doing great. Industrials, um, let me get back up here. Here we go. Industrial, same thing. Making this move, breaking out above the double top. Once again, back on July 12th, that's when we saw the industrial start to move back up, make the breakout, very similar to financials, came back up right before the Fed meeting, ready to go, and the Fed disappoints again. Goes back down, start the rally, then we get the Jackson Hole speech, we also had the minutes, and from there, we've seen industrials rolling again. So these are a couple of areas, and by the way, financials, I've shown it before, I think I may have shown it last week um, in this report, or maybe in an article, I don't remember where I showed it. I show it, I've showed a lot of things in a lot of different places. But financials on a relative basis, these last four months of the year, September through December, that's their sweet spot. Financials love the last four months of the year, and they couldn't be set up much better going into the last four months with rates expected to come down, charts breaking out. It looks really good here for those, for those groups. Um, industry groups. So what you can do, I'm going to show you how you can get to this page. This is the industry summary page at Stock Charts. If you're on your dashboard and you scroll over here under member tools, go down under summary pages. And here is industry summary. So you click on that. Now you could look at each one of these industry groups within each sector. Just by clicking on it, it'll pull up the charts. You can just get a really quick two month view of what's going on. Here you can see internet stocks breaking out above a couple recent uh, highs. So that's probably good news, I would think, for internet. Um, but anyway, I like to use the table view. Um, table view to me, I don't know, I'm a numbers person. I just, I resonate more with the numbers sometimes. Um, and so I could go down here and quickly just take a look and see automobiles had a really good day. Or if we want to look at the whole week, just change that period to week. And then you can see internet really didn't have a good week, but they did come back late in the week. Um, we had hotels do well last week, over 2%. Um, tobacco, pipelines, oh, specialty finance, 4.84%. Consumer finance, look at all these financial groups doing extremely well, almost all of them. I, don't, I think the S&P 500, I, I believe every one of these financial industry groups beat the S&P 500 last week, every one of them. And then you go into the industrials down here, and most of these beat. You had a few at the bottom not doing so well, trucking uh, notably very weak, but then you had railroads on the other side doing really well, airlines doing pretty well. So we actually have the transports moving back up again. Anyway, um, this is one way to look at the industry groups. Now, what I like to do and what we do for our members is we have what's, what we call our industry group relative strength chart list. So we have all of those relative or all those industry groups but we've got them in one chart list with every single one of these industry groups relative to the S&P 500. So all I have to do is pull up this chart list, put it into summary form, hit one week period, and it tells me there's specialty finance. It was the best performing group relative to the S&P 500 last week. Railroads were second. Then you had consumer finance, third and so on and so forth. But look at the groupings that we're leading. Here's, we got financial industry group. Here's an industrial, financial, 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 healthcare, industrial, financial, staples. We do have a couple, oh, I showed you the computer services, the uh, technology group that still had a pretty good week, even though technology was down. And here's the other one down here. There's the electrical components. So we did have two technology groups among the leaders. They just weren't semiconductors, which of course semiconductors is where most of the weighting is in the XLK, in the technology area. So um, yeah, I mean, it was a lot more, I'm not going to say totally defensive because I don't really think of financials and industrials as defensive. They're more defensive than technology, but they're still aggressive. They do well when the economy is humming along and so forth, or when the economy is expected to hum along. And now that we still have the possibility of a soft landing, 
which is the Fed switching to cutting rates, while at the same time, the economy remains strong. We haven't seen, we've seen some weakening, but then kind of some strengthening coming back in. If the economy can stay strong and the inflation fight is over, this is nirvana for equities. Now we still have September to deal with, early October, we got the presidential election. These are all things that have historically caused some problems for the market. So I don't think it's just straight up because of that. But looking at a lot of the charts, I mean, the only thing I'm seeing that I would be aware of is the rotation, moving away from some of those more aggressive areas into other areas that I'm showing you right now. Um, if, I, if we pull up that specialty finance group, um, here is the DJ USSP. Look at this chart. You don't have to, I mean, let me show you the financial or the uh, semiconductors. You know, everybody's still caught up in trying to trade semiconductors. I called a top on that back that day. And I said, leave them alone until they, until they break out or until they've pulled back for a period of time and they start to just look better from a technical perspective on pullbacks. But otherwise, this ship has sailed. I mean, not to say they're not going to come back and start, you know, rallying and setting new all-time highs somewhere down the road, because I do believe they're going to. But you had, we had such a big run in semiconductors. It was time for them to pass the baton on. That's what they've done. And so that's kind of what you're seeing with areas like specialty finance. Because back when semiconductors topped, specialty finance was down around 610. Now they're almost 710, almost 100 points. What's that? Um 17% rise in the last two and a half months. Maybe, yeah, two and a half months. 17%. So it's just a rotation that's taking place. This is bullish. This is consistent with every secular bull market we've ever had. Money rotates. When, it, when we sell off in areas like semiconductors, the money doesn't leave the market. It just rotates into something else. So yeah, some semiconductors are weak. But we have other areas that pick up, um, you know, their share, and then they start to lead for a while, and they allow the semiconductors to take a break. And so right now, this is what we're seeing in the financial area and in the industrials, other areas breaking out to carry, help carry the load for a while. All right, so what do you do with that information? You know, the specialty finance is leading. We know financials are doing well. So what do we do with that? Well, if you're an earnings beats member, you go into our strong earnings chart list, and if I get rid of specialty finance over here, it'll just bring up all of the stocks on our strong earnings chart list, right? So we can sort it by percentage change last week if we wanted to. So go back one week and see what's worked. NTNX up 18%, um, Ever up 11%, AVAV 10% and so on. You can see some of the industry groups. I mean, you might look at maybe see if there's some industrials, a couple industrials scattered in here. I'm still looking for a financial. Here's a couple of financials. So you had Allstate, Goosehead, um, PGR, which is, um, um, I think that's progressive. Yeah. So, I mean, look at the progressive, progressive chart. Very, very strong. So there's a lot of different ways to um, take a look at... Uh, uh, the different stocks that we have, right? All right. Uh, so anyway, if you go into this search table, though, that's what I was getting at. If you go into the search table, we can pull up specialty. Now, if I pull up specialty, you're going to have specialty chemicals, retailers, REITs, um, specialty finance. You have all kinds of different specialties. So you just keep going until you get all of specialty finance listed. And there it is. And if you go and you take a look, you can sort this in scooter order. So I would say probably there are five of these six just, just off the cuff that I think look pretty good. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I think I already pulled up MSCI over here. Um, yeah, that was MSCI. So it had a pretty decent week here. Not bad, but this is the worst of the bunch. If we go back over here. Let's take a look at KKR, which has the highest scooter score. And you can see moving right up near that breakout level getting ready to break out. Um, go to the next couple. Here's one right behind it. This is uh, TransUnion, already broken out, trending up. Watch 20-day tests for possible entries. Uh, MCO, another one, just going straight up. MC, 
We've got a little cup handle coming down. 20-day test here would be beautiful. That would be a nice little full handle there. SPGI just broke out above the recent highs around 495. Look at the 20-day moving average sitting at 496. So any kind of a little 2-3% pullback in the stock takes us right back down to a key support level. So this is how you start to prepare for your trades. You find out what's working when and inevitably we'll get a pullback from time to time, but start looking for some of your stocks. We do all the research for you. Just go in, find out what's working. This is um, this is that relative strength chart list, annual members. We give this one to annual members because it took us a long time to put it together. So anything where we're putting a lot of time into something, we want to make sure that our members are committing to us as well. But if you're an annual member, you get all of the chart lists that we offer. And even trial and monthly members get most everything that we have to offer. There's only a, a few charts that we normally will reserve for annual members. Um, but here you've got all of the industry groups telling you what was leading. You could quickly go in and take a look at the DJ USSP. See if you like the chart. I mean, just because it's leading this week doesn't necessarily mean it, it mean it's a great week. Um, you've also got railroads. Let's take a look at the railroad group. Here's railroads. I think this one's starting to look good. Look at these tests all of a sudden holding on the 20-day moving average. So instead of trending down below the moving averages, we came up through. When did we come up through, by the way? Right around that July 12th period. That was when June CPI report came out. When you start getting signs that the that interest rate cuts are coming, you start to see rotation in the market. So that was a very early sign that railroads were loved, are going to be loved in a, in a declining interest rate environment. And if you think about it from a fundamental standpoint, if you're cutting rates, what typically happens to the economy? It typically strengthens. Now, a lot of the problem when, they, when rates are being cut, a lot of times it's because of a weak economy. And so you're trying to cut rates to get the econ to spur the economy. And it takes a while. So that's why when rates are being cut, sometimes the market moves down with those rate cuts. In this case, we don't have a weak economy. Rates went up because of inflation, not because of trying to cool an overheated economy. We were trying to cool inflation. So rates went up because of inflation, and that did help to choke off some of the growth. And we've seen a little bit of deterioration. But if, we, if the economy remains resilient and rates come back down, that's going to be a boon to some of these cyclical stocks like railroads. Um, anyway, when I went through the strong earnings, I pulled up railroad and or pulled up railroads here. And one was on our list and that's NSC, Norfolk Southern. And if you look at Norfolk Southern, look at what happened back in mid-July right here. Beautiful start to this move. And we've just continued going. We're getting now up close to that 260 high. I think eventually we're breaking out. And what's really interesting is on July 1st, right here, if you're a member of Earnings Beats, go back to our EB weekly market report because I keep a list of stocks that I like for the long term and I just routinely add some from time to time. July 1st, we added Norfolk Southern to that list. So, and this is for long term investors. So, this is, I mean, it's for anyone, but you know, clearly on the chart, this wasn't a great look from a short term trading perspective. I'm a momentum trader, I don't usually like to buy stocks when they're trending down below their moving averages. I like to trade them when they're trending above. Um, that's when they're more likely to bounce. So, um, but here, for a benefit for the long-term folks was that this was added back on July 1st. That was the day that this was added to our long-term trades, which is what we call it, on our weekly market report that comes out to our members every Monday, usually early afternoon. Some, I'd like to get it in the morning, but sometimes in the afternoon. Anyway, um, since July 1st, we've seen this stock, and this is a pretty nice dividend pair, by the way, and that's what most of them are in our long-term trades. We're looking for companies that will you know, pay out nice dividends, but also have the capability to uh, provide some capital appreciation as well. And NSC was at 213 when we put it out, now it's 256. So in just two months, um, we've gone up, what, 40 some dollars, which is, I don't know, 15, 17, 18% capital appreciation plus a dividend thrown in there already. Anyway, 
This is a, a, you know, railroads do well over the long term. They're not leaders. They're not semiconductors, for goodness sakes. But they are steady growers over time. And especially when it's good, when the market environment is good for cyclical stocks, generally you're going to see the railroads doing well, which is what we have now and kind of what I expect through the balance of this year. So I like the railroads and I like Norfolk Southern. I think eventually we're going to get that breakout. I've been calling for that for a while. Hasn't happened, but that breakout in transports. All right. Um, that is essentially what I wanted to go over today. So um, I would just point everyone to Earnings Beats. If you are not already uh, connected with us at Earnings Beats, I certainly would strongly encourage you to do so. First, we have a free newsletter. So even if you don't want to take the plunge and try our service, free newsletter, no credit card required. Just go down, go to our homepage at earningsbeats.com. Scroll down. There'll be an area right here where you can sign up, name and email address, and then you can simply uh, um, join us. It's a Monday and Wednesday newsletter article that we send out teaching some of the things that we like, you know, our approach to the market, but also providing trading candidates. Of course, that's completely up to you. It's uh, it's your risk, not ours. Um, we put them out there for educational reasons, but we also have some who will write in, say they they trade them. Um, so it is kind of, we're trying to um, at least encourage you to look at certain things when you trade. Um, our our uh, tagline, better timing, better trades. We like to wait on pullbacks to try and get in with lesser risk to the downside. So we'll point out some of those things. But anyway, just sign up, name, email address, and you'll get in. You can unsubscribe at any time. And again, no credit card required. Now, if you want to try our service, our paid service, we do have a no cost 30 day trial, no cost at all. Um, but you do have to provide credit cards so we can set you up in our system. But we will notify you at the end of your trial before you get charged. We'll notify you, let you know that you're going to be charged if you don't cancel. Um, so make sure, you know, that's what you want to do. We only want members who want to be with us. Um, but anyway, make sure you check that out. Now, for those of you who are on mobile devices, um, you can certainly just click on the QR code on your screen, and that will take you to the landing page where you can sign up for our EB Digest. If you like our what we do here in these weekly market re uh, recaps, please hit that like button. Um, very simple. Subscribe to our channel. We'd like to build our community here on YouTube. So that'll really help us if you're not already subscribed. And also the timing of our videos. We have a lot of folks ask us, how do we know when you post something? Well, on YouTube, the best thing to do is subscribe. Subscribe, turn your notifications on. As soon as we upload a video, you'll be notified. As soon as you're on YouTube, you'll be notified uh, and you can join in at your leisure. So that's the best way to keep up with us uh, on these YouTube videos. But anyway, please like, and subscribe. We'd love to have that support. Have a great week, everybody. Happy trading.